Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ford Presidential Library, and welcome to summer as opposed to winter two weeks ago. <laughs> we make quick transitions here. My name is Elaine Didier, and it's my privilege to serve as director of both the library here in Ann Arbor and the museum in Grand Rapids. And I want to welcome you on behalf of David Ferriero, the archivist of the United States, who is our boss. Tonight's program is brought to you by the National Archives with additional support from the Ford Foundation. I want to thank all of you who are members of Friends of Ford because it is your contributions that make these programs possible. Our, our federal funding pays for the buildings and the archival and museum staff, but not beyond that. So uh, it's your support that uh, we're, we're very, very grateful to have. Professor Scott Kaufman is no stranger to the Ford Presidential Library. In 2014, he received a Ford Presidential Foundation Research Travel Grant. Much of the research for the book came from the archives and manuscripts collections here at the library, and he also received assistance through interviews with President Ford's son, Steve Ford. Scott is the chair of the history department at Francis Marion University, where he teaches American diplomatic and military history. For those of you not familiar with Francis Marion, it is a younger institution founded in 1970, has a liberal arts focus and 3,500 undergraduate students. Professor Kaufman earned his doctorate at Ohio University, not Ohio State, but the <laughs> other Ohio University. I need to be clear about that. This is Ann Arbor after all. Scott is a prolific and widely published scholar. He is the author, co-author, or editor of 11 books on US foreign policy and diplomacy and the history of the presidency and first ladies. He is a feature expert in an organization you might not have heard of called Sheffer, the Society for Historians of American Foreign Relations, and it is the leading organization for historians of international affairs. Uh, his writings in general have focused on both the Ford and the Carter administrations, First Lady Rosalind Carter, U.S. foreign policy during the Cold War, and nuclear testing. He's currently writing another book on the environment and international diplomacy, and that will be released this fall. With regard to his new book, there have been many, many reviews from outstanding presidential historians calling it, and I quote, the best biography of President Gerald Ford, and another comment, uh, which I really appreciated, this is from Jeremy Surrey, Jeremy Surrey at University of Texas. The book is also a persuasive history of American society in the 20th century during that period in politics. It shows the policies for integrity and cooperation in politics. What a concept. <laughs> Think about that. At any rate, please welcome Scott Kaufman back to the Ford Library to talk about his new book. Thank you. And uh, given that we are at an academic institution, I did want to let you know there will be an exam after uh, this talk. Um, I think Kate will be handing out copies of that near the end, so do make sure to take that. Uh, you'll have 15 minutes for the exam, so you will have time for it. Now, in all seriousness, it, it is wonderful to be back here at the, at the Ford Library. Um, I want to thank Elaine for her wonderful introduction, and there's so many other people I have to thank as well. Uh, Joe Westfall, Geyer Gunderson, Kate Murray, Tina Luckett, Kristen Mooney, Joe Calvaruso, all of them, the Ford Library staff, uh, all of you for the wonderful time you, you showed me when I was here and for coming to my talk. I also very much want to thank the National Archives and definitely the Gerald R. Ford Foundation for its support for this project. I can tell you right now, this would not have gotten off the ground uh, without their support. Um, it's also wonderful to be back in, in Ann Arbor. When I was here in 2014, I spent four weeks here at the library, and it just so happened, by pure luck, that it, it coincided with the uh, art festival, the art fair you have here. Uh, I, my wife came up to visit me my last weekend here, and we had a wonderful time at the art fair. It's really an incredible um, event you have here, and for those people who will watch this on YouTube, if you have not been to Ann Arbor to come to the art fair, do it. It's absolutely a must-see. So, to the book. Um, if Gerald Ford was alive today, I think he would very likely have a case of deja vu. Let's look at some of the things that are happening right now. The president is under investigation by a special counsel. 
There are questions whether the president is part of a conspiracy. There are questions whether the president obstructed justice. John Dean seems to be everywhere on television right now. And at least one member of Congress and a national ad campaign are calling for the president's impeachment. Now, of course, for many of you here, this will be day, this is deja vu for you as well, because what I'm referring to, of course, are events uh, tied to the Watergate scandal and to the resignation of President Richard Nixon, events that propelled Gerald Ford into the presidency. But there is one other memory that Ford likely would recall. Some media outlets have wondered whether President Trump will pardon individuals who are tied to the scandals surrounding his administration. In fact, just last month, Time Magazine wondered whether Trump might issue a pardon for his personal counsel, his personal attorney, Michael Cohen, before Cohen is charged with the crime, just as Ford pardoned Richard Nixon. And it is that issue of pardons that I want to come back to here in a little bit, because it ties in with how Gerald Ford has been remembered. And I want to say a few words about that and how I think he should be remembered. But let me turn to the book, and I'm going to add a few things on to what Elaine said. Although the subtitle of this book is a political biography of Gerald R. Ford, I would suggest to you it's more than that. First of all, it is also very much a study of the Republican Party. Certainly from the time that Gerald Ford was elected to the House of Representatives in 1948, to the point, well, pretty much to the point at which he passed away in 2006. Second of all, in writing this book, I relied on a wide variety of source material, and of course, the, the Joel R. Ford Library's um, records were essential. But I turned as well to a, a nearly a dozen other archives, some of them with the help of a colleague of mine, Dr. Alyssa Waters, as well as other government documents, memoirs, newspapers, journals, uh, magazines, and a good number of interviews, some of them which I conducted with Dr. Waters, including about a half dozen members of Congress who served with Ford, and, of course, with Steve Ford, as Elaine pointed out, who was absolutely wonderful to speak with. Thirdly, while a lot has been written about President Ford, far less has been written about his career outside the presidency, his political career outside the presidency, his life outside the presidency. And so readers will find that about two-thirds of my book is not focused on the presidency. It's on his life before entering Congress, his work as a member of Congress, and his life following the presidency. And last but not least, I think popular culture can say a lot about the times in which people lived. And so readers of this book will find references to TV shows, movies, books, such as the movies The Towering Inferno and Airport 1975, the books The Catcher in the Rye and The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit, and the TV programs Ozzy and Harriet, The Simpsons, and of course, Saturday Night Live. So let me speak a little bit about where this book came out of. Um, in, around 2011, I was asked by a man named Peter Coveney, who was an editor for Wiley Blackwell, to edit a series of essays on Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter. I'd been doing work on Jimmy Carter for many years. I felt I knew the literature on him, literature on him quite well. But I felt I didn't know nearly as much about Gerald Ford. So I began doing a lot of reading about him. And it came to my attention that there was room for another biography of him. There had been only two published since he had passed away in 2006. One of them was Doug Brinkley's short biography that came out in 2007, and then, of course, James Cannon's biography that came out in 2014. But I felt that both books left a number of stones unturned. So I contacted Fred Woodward, Fred Woodward, who was the chief editor at the University Press of Kansas. I said, I have this idea for writing a biography of Ford. What do you think? He thought, great idea. Do it. And the rest is history and Ambition, Pragmatism, and Party came out last year. The book's title is based around what I see as three themes that I believe address Ford's life. Ambition. Ford was a very ambitious individual, someone who sought to climb the ladder of influence in whatever he did. In Boy Scouts, he wanted to become an Eagle Scout. In high school and in college, he played football and wanted to be a starter on the varsity teams. In the US Navy, he wanted to climb up the uh, ranks of command on the ship on which he served. In Congress, he wanted to become House Speaker. He enjoyed being president and sought to be elected president in his own right in 1976. In 1980, 
He considered running for the presidency in his own right and then looked at the possibility of becoming Ronald Reagan's running mate that year. And when that all fell through, he still sought to have influence. He was still ambitious. For instance, he sat on numerous corporate boards as a former president. Party. Ford was a lifelong Republican who was a member of the moderate wing of that party, loyal to his party. But that loyalty did mean that at times he had to change his views on the issues, which I'll say more about here in a minute. And lastly, pragmatism. Ford was loyal to his party, but he wasn't an ideologue. He was someone who was willing to reach across party lines. Grand Rapids, which became Ford's hometown, was a city marked by what scholars and Ford's contemporaries referred to as a Midwestern form of conservatism. This meant limited government, fiscal frugality, piety, but of a non-fundamentalist sort. It also meant political moderation, pragmatism, and a willingness to compromise, including a willingness to reach across party lines. And this could be seen in Ford as both a member of Congress and as a president. And even as an ex-president, he reached across party lines, setting a precedent by working with Jimmy Carter, a Democrat, on a number of issues. And Ford became more liberal on a variety of social issues. So let me speak about some specifics from the book and, and explain how they tie in with these three themes. Ford's personality and political views, I think, were influenced by a variety of factors. One of them was his mother, Dorothy. Dorothy Ford, well, actually, she was Dorothy King, had married a man by the name of Liz Leslie Lynch King. Leslie Lynch King was an abusive husband and an abusive father mentally and physically abused Dorothy, threatened the life of their newborn son. It reached the point that Dorothy decided she had to flee him and seek a divorce, which she did, taking with her her young son, the person who became Gerald R. Ford Jr. And this is important because through much of the 20th century, the idea of seeking a divorce was stigmatized, especially when children were involved. But for Dorothy, this had to be done for her well-being and the well-being of her child. And so she became, to her son, an example of strength and perseverance in the face of terrible odds. Then there was Gerald Ford Sr., whom Dorothy married in 1917. And the person Ford considered to be his biological father, at least until he found out in his teen years that Ford Sr. was his stepfather. But even then, he saw Ford Sr. as his father. It was Ford Sr. who introduced Jerry and Jerry's stepbrothers to sports, including football. It was Gerald Ford Sr. who, in October of 1929, opened up his own paint and varnish business. Of course, it was probably the worst timing possible, because later that month the stock market crashed and the country went into the Great Depression. Yet Ford Sr. was able to keep that business open and to do so without seeking federal assistance. He became, to his son, another example of strength and perseverance in the face of terrible odds. But also the fact that he was able to keep his business open without federal assistance also influenced Ford. Because Ford saw in his father an example of how one should try to make ends meet without seeking government help. In addition to being examples of strength and perseverance, in addition to the fiscal lessons that Ford learned from his father or stepfather. His parents also influenced him through their religious devotion. Now, I should point out when it came to their religious devotion, um, it, was, it was more of a personal spirituality. Talking with Steve Ford, reading about Gerald Ford and Steve's other brothers and, and Susan, his sister, um, it was much more a personal spirituality. They weren't open about it, but they were definitely devout. And also Ford's parents influenced him because they insisted that all their children do their chores and be honest. And that idea, do your chores, tied him with something else about Ford, a strong work ethic. Ford once said, the harder you work, the luckier you are. The more effort you put into what you do, the greater the dividends. And that was something Ford definitely lived by. 
that was something that he was inspired to do by his parents, but also something he himself built on. And then he was also influenced by Boy Scouts and football. Both of them taught him to work as a member of a team. And football taught him that even though you work hard, there may be times you're going to lose. But don't give up. Pull yourself up, dust yourself off, and prepare as hard as you can for the next game. So here is an individual who believes in strength, perseverance, working hard, doing the best you can at what you do. But there are two other things I should mention about Ford. He could be stubborn. And something else about Ford is he could be naive. Ford once said that he believed that no matter how bad a person seemed, there had to be good in that person. And the idea was to go out and try to bring the good out of that person. The problem was that Ford so, sometimes so looked so hard for the good that he overlooked the bad. And that, too, could cause him difficulties, as we'll see here in a little bit. This ambitiousness Ford had, the theme of ambition, this ambitiousness that Ford had became clear repeatedly. As I mentioned, he wanted to become and became an Eagle Scout. He wanted to be the starting center on the varsity football teams in both high school and college and achieved both. In fact, he played so well at the University of Michigan that he was offered an opportunity to play professional football. But he turned it down. He turned down that opportunity because he wanted to go into law. Through hard work and through perseverance, and a little luck, Ford clawed his way into Yale Law School, did very well there, and afterwards returned to Grand Rapids to practice law, but also by this time to think about the possibility of getting into politics. But before any of that could happen, before he could even think about a career in politics, Japan, on December 7th of 1941, attacked Pearl Harbor. Like many Americans, Ford wanted to serve his country in the U.S. military to fight against America's enemies, and he did just that. He joined the U.S. Navy. First, he was assigned to the home front. Didn't want to be here. Wanted to be where the action was. Was able to get himself assigned to the U.S. aircraft carrier Monterey. He was assigned as a gunnery officer. Didn't want that. Wanted to be in the bridge where the action was. Through hard work, and through some luck, he was able to become assistant navigation officer, serve on the bridge where the action was. And then when the war ended, Ford, now lieutenant com uh, commander, would return home and be discharged from the Navy and now had an opportunity to return to Grand Rapids to continue his ambitions there. He rejoins, he gets back into law in Grand Rapids, but as I mentioned, he had developed an interest in politics. In 1940, Ford had won to work for the campaign of Wendell Wilkie. Wendell Wilkie, who was the Republican nominee for president that year. And he won to work for the Wilkie campaign in Michigan, especially in the Grand Rapids area. But to be able to work for the Wilkie campaign, Ford would have to get the support of a local party boss, a man named Frank McKay. He went to see McKay, Spent about three hours waiting to see McKay and finally got to see the party boss. And McKay gave him a few minutes of his time and seemed, what have one, seemed to have no interest whatsoever in Ford. Left a very sour taste in Ford's mouth. He would, would end up working for the Wilkie campaign in New York City, or New York, and became enamored with politics. So now that he's back in Michigan, he decides he wants to run for Congress, wants to represent the 5th District the Michigan's 5th District in the U.S. House Representatives. He wants to fight for that election in 1948. But he knows he's a long shot. Number one, he's a novice. Number two, he's going to have to win the Republican primary against the incumbent, himself a Republican, and a member of the McKay Party machine, a man named Frank Yonkman. Yet Ford, being the hard worker, the ambitious individ individual, is ready to take on the challenge. But there is one potential problem. Ford falls in love. He meets a woman by the name of Betty Warren, who was in the process of getting divorced. She thought he was crazy for wanting to be involved with a divorcee. I mean, this was, the 5th District was a conservative district. She wondered, why would you want to get involved with me? This could hurt your chances. Ford didn't care. He fell for her. She fell for him. And not long after their, her divorce, they decided to get married. But Ford made it very clear to Betty 
the marriage is going to have to wait till the fall of 1948. He didn't explain why, but the reason was simple. He knew that if he could win the Republican primary against Yonkman, he was home free. The 5th District had gone Democrat only once between 1920 and 1948. If he can get past Yonkman, which means keeping things with Betty kind of quiet, then no problem. Well, sure enough, through hard work and again through some luck, Ford was able to defeat Yonkman in the Republican primary. He marries Betty, and then he goes on to win the general election and now becomes a member of Congress. And thus begins a quarter century career in Congress. Ford's motto that hard work brings luck seemed to come true again. When very early in his congressional career, he got himself appointed to the very important and very influential Appropriations Committee. He proved himself loyal to his party. He was a political partisan one who was far more supportive of the two Republican presidents he served under, Dwight D. Eisenhower and Richard Nixon, than the three Democrats he served under, Harry Truman, John F. Kennedy, and Lyndon Johnson. In terms of policy, Ford tended to strongly support foreign aid and defense programs that were designed to combat communism and protect national, U.S. national security. He supported the U.S. war in Vietnam, although he felt that Lyndon Johnson should have prosecuted the war primarily through air and naval power as opposed to using ground troops. He was less supportive of social programs. Influenced by his father's experiences as well as his own, his own he believed that social programs encouraged people to live off federal assistance rather than pull themselves up without government help. Because of his loyalty to the Republican Party, Ford sometimes had to take positions on issues differently, different than the ones he previously took. And this especially became the case after he became minority leader in 1965, which I'll say more about here momentarily. For instance, Ford had opposed Lyndon Johnson's Great Society programs, believing that they encouraged people to live off federal assistance. Yet he supported Richard Nixon's family assistance plan, even though it would increase the number of people in the welfare, ro welfare roles. He had adopted a hard line toward communist China. But when Nixon decided to open the door to a rapprochement with China, Ford was behind him on it. And this changing of position could at times cause some consternation among Ford's uh, constituents. Give you an example. In 1972, in February of 1972, Richard Nixon became the first American president to visit China since it had gone communist in 1949. And after, the vi after Nixon's visit, Ford decided, I want to go to China. I want to see what it's all about. So he arranges a trip to China. One of, the, one of my favorite collections for the Ford Library is the congressional papers, because they really give you a good sense of what was going through the minds of Americans in and outside of Ford's district. When Ford announced that he was going to communist China, some of his constituents said, great idea, think it's a good thing here to improve our relations. But there were some people who weren't very happy with him. Uh, to give you one example, uh, a constituent from Grand Haven, which was in Ford's district, wrote Ford, and I'm quoting here, I do not want to wish you any bad luck, but I hope your aircraft falls in the middle of the Pacific Ocean <laughs> for stabbing the American people in the back. It was the same kind of fraternizing, collaborating, and double-cross that helped the Nazis take over the Netherlands in 1941. Uh, so, so yeah, he could cause some consternation among, among his constituents. Yet Ford's loyalty to his party didn't mean he was an ideologue. He was a pragmatist. He supported defense and foreign aid programs, whether they were being promoted by a Republican or a Democrat. He endorsed elements of President Truman's Fair Deal program, such as its call for expanding Social Security. On civil rights and the environment, he was more progressive than many of his colleagues were, but at the same time less progressive than others. For instance, if given the choice, he would have preferred that civil rights and the environment be protected primarily by the states rather than the federal government. 
but he was more than prepared to support federal laws on both issues. He voted for federal laws to eliminate the poll tax to vote. He voted for the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and the 1963 Clean Air Act. During that quarter century in Congress, Ford never sponsored a single major piece of legislation. During that quarter century, he proved he wasn't a very good speaker. Even he knew he was not the best of speakers. He was very intelligent, but it wasn't the kind of intelligence where he made a quick decision. Rather, he liked to hear all sides, to hear what, every, what people from different sides had to say. Mull over those ideas. Think about them and then make a decision. And there's one other thing about Ford as a congressperson. He had a lot of trouble coming up with a vision, an explanation of how specific policies fit into a broader vision of where he wanted the nation to go. And this was something recognized by even his colleagues. One of the people he served with, who became a very close colleague of his, was a Wisconsin Republican representative named Melvin Laird. Melvin Laird said of Ford, Jerry doesn't catch on as rapidly as he should to, to the political significance of an event or issue. Once he understands it, there's no problem, but it does take him time. Yet because Ford was willing to listen to all sides, because he was a pragmatist, because he was willing to reach across party lines, and because he was a gregarious person, he became well-liked. Democrats liked him. Ford was asked by Democrats in Congress to join the committee that established the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. He was asked by President Johnson to join the Warren Commission to investigate the Kennedy assassination. Because he was willing to listen to all sides, he became well-liked among Republicans. And this became important as well because of his ambitiousness. By his third term in Congress, Ford had decided he wanted to become Speaker of the House. He knew this would take a lot of work and a lot of effort. And he did just that, put a lot of time into it. And he became tied in with a group of younger Republicans in the House who became known as the Young Turks. These were individuals who included people like Melvin Laird, Charles Goodell, by the way, his son might ring a bell, the name of his son might ring a bell, Roger Goodell, the chairman of the NFL, and a man who just put out a book on Ford uh, yesterday, Donald Rumsfeld. The Young Turks believed the Republican leadership in the House was too old, too unenergetic, and too willing to accept the idea of the Republicans being a minority in the House. They felt what was needed was younger leadership, more energized leadership, individuals who would seek to make the Republican Party a majority. It was with the support of the Young Turks that Ford in 1965 became minority leader in the House, putting him one step away from his dream of becoming Speaker. If only the Republicans could get the majority in the House. Yet he would never achieve that dream but he would work hard for it. And the question becomes, what did that mean for his family? I talk about his family quite a bit in the book. By 1957, the Fords had four children, three sons, Jack, Michael, and Steve, and a daughter, Susan. Yet because he was so ambitious, so determined to climb up the ranks in Congress, Ford was an absent husband and father. He woke up early, he would swim laps in the pool of, their home in of the family home in Alexandria, Virginia, and then he'd be at work by 8 a.m. He traveled a lot. Some years he was gone as many as 280 days. He wouldn't get home until late at night. He tried to be home on Sundays. And he also, if he was home on Saturdays, he would try to spend time with the family by taking the kids with him to his office at the Capitol building, where I should point out they engaged in a little mischief. Uh, one of the interviews I read uh, was from Ford's administrative assistant, 
who said that when Ford would bring his kids over to his office, they would move nameplates around and little things like that. So I asked Steve Ford when I interviewed him, did you do that? And the fact that he did not give me a direct answer <laughs> suggests to me that it probably did indeed happen. But again, home Sundays if he, as much as possible, try to be home on Saturdays if he could, spend, take the kids with him to his office, but otherwise he was gone. And it was very hard on Betty. She loved her husband. She supported his political ambitions. But he was gone so much and she was lonely. And she began to seek an outlet. And she found it in alcohol. I assume all of us here are very well aware that alcoholism can run in families from one generation to another. Betty's father had been an alcoholic, and she began to abuse alcohol. She also became, became addicted to painkillers, which she started to take for a bad back. Ford was aware that something was up with his wife, but for the most part was oblivious to it. And again, this was very hard on Betty. But in 1972, she had some hope. In 1972, Nixon had run for re-election against the Democratic nominee George McGovern, trounced McGovern in that election. Yet, the Democrats held on to Congress. And Ford thought to himself, my gosh, if the Democrats can put up such a poor candidate as McGovern for the presidency, and McGovern gets trounced that badly, yet the Democrats hold on to Congress, hold on to the House, I don't see how it'll ever become Speaker of the House. So he says to Betty, look, here's what I'd like to do. I want to stay in office for two more terms. That'll get me to 1976, the end of Richard Nixon's second term, and of course, under the Constitution, his last term, and then I'll retire. And she thought, great, this is wonderful. I'll finally have my husband back. That was, of course, before some unprecedented events occurred that would propel Ford into the White House. October 1973, Vice President Spiro Agnew is forced to resign because he'd been taking bribes. Richard Nixon asked people in Congress, asked friends of his, who should I nominate to replace Agnew? And numerous people said to him, especially members of Congress, if you want someone who's going to get a confirmed, nominate Gerald Ford. So Nixon offers him the vice presidency. Betty wasn't very happy about this. She, she supported him. She believed this was best for the country, but she was really worried. My gosh, if my husband becomes vice president, I'm going to see him even less than I already am. Ford tried to reassure her, don't worry, vice presidents don't do anything. <laughs> That's what he said. Um, but, but she was very unhappy. In fact, uh, Steve Ford mentioned that his mother hit the roof over this. And I think there's no better example of how unhappy Betty was was when after Ford was confirmed as vice president, Richard Nixon goes to shake the hands of both of the, both of the Fords, congratulating them. And when he shakes Betty's hand and congratulates her, her response was, congratulations or condolences. Now, if Betty wasn't happy, Susan is elated. She had made a $5 bet with her mother that her father was going to be the nominee for the vice presidency. Sure enough, the call comes in, he's the nominee, and she's all excited, and she's calling friends of hers to let them know that he's the nominee. Well, the problem is she's tying up a phone line. She's tying up a phone line in the house, in Alexandria. And Ford decides, I've got to use the phone. I've got to be able to call people, tell them what's going on. So he tells an aide of his, tell my daughter to get off the phone. And then he thinks to himself, hmm, father telling his teenage daughter to get off the phone, that might not have enough punch to it. Um, Goes to the aide and says, uh, no, tell her the vice president wants her off the phone. <laughs> and, and I have a feeling that probably did the job of getting her off the phone. So Ford is now vice president. And his naivety becomes clear here. By this time, the Watergate scandal is big news. Questions whether Richard Nixon was involved in this in some way or another. Nixon telling people publicly, I am not involved in this. I have no part in Watergate. And he's telling Ford the same thing. And Ford believes him. Now granted, 
as the months go on and the evidence is building, Ford does begin to distance himself a little bit from Nixon, yet he still believes that Nixon is being truthful with him. That was until the smoking gun tape came out, which showed that indeed Richard Nixon had been involved in a conspiracy and had obstructed, had obstructed justice. When Ford realized that the president had lied to him, a person he considered a friend, a person he had known from day one in Congress, it stung. But Ford realizes what's in store for him. Richard Nixon, given a choice between a patient and a resignation, resigns. And Ford now becomes president of the United States. And it's amazing to think about it. Eight months earlier, he was minority leader in Congress. And now he's president of the United States. And just to give you an idea how fast all of this happened, Ford had kept his home phone number listed in the white pages <laughs> of their home, in, I'm not kidding, of the home in Alexandria. Because he believed whether as minority leader or vice president, I want people to be able to get a hold of me. Now all of a sudden he's president of the United States and he's told you've got to get an unlisted number, which he does. But, but again, it, it demonstrates just how fast and how unexpected all of this was. So Ford enters the presidency, and he enters the presidency as a popular president. Someone, to use his words, someone who, um, oh, I should go here, someone who, uh, to use his words, would end America's nightmare. He gave the impression that he was an average Joe who raised an average American family. He worked in his shirt sleeves, cooked his own breakfast. His favorite meal was an English muffin with melon, orange juice, and tea uh, for breakfast. For, for dinner, he liked to have steak or pot roast with red cabbage and a scoop of butter pecan ice cream for dessert. He and Betty were an attractive couple with four attractive children, two of whom, Susan and Steve, still lived at home. They were God-fearing. They enjoyed the sport, enjoyed sports. They enjoyed the outdoors. They were gregarious. Uh, I would almost call them the type of family you would love to have over, put on a football game, grill some hamburgers and hot dogs, and watch the game with. Yet the image of the all-American father, of the all-American family, didn't last. And it didn't last because a month after becoming president, Ford pardoned Richard Nixon. There are numerous reasons that have been given for this, some of them by Ford himself. The belief that Nixon couldn't get a fair trial, that Nixon had suffered enough already. In fact, Ford had heard that Nixon was not doing well, may not live much longer. And also Ford commented that he was tired of reporters asking him questions. What are you going to do with Nixon? Will you pardon him? Will he go to trial? And Ford felt to himself, there are more important issues this country needs to deal with. And I have to get Nixon behind me. Hence the pardon. But he did a very poor job of preparing the American people for this decision. Now, whether trying to prepare the American people would have made a big difference, we could debate. But he did a very poor job of preparing the American people. And so when he pardoned Nixon, the anger was intense. Some people claiming there was a conspiracy here, that Ford was part of a conspiracy whereby Nixon gave Ford the presidency in return for a promise from Ford to pardon him. There's no evidence of such a conspiracy, but Americans definitely were furious with the president. One aide later said that the pardon destroyed Ford's image and made it hard for Ford to talk about anything else. And there was a lot of anything else Ford had to deal with. The U.S. withdrawal from Vietnam. The Maiguez crisis, when Cambodia seized the U.S. merchant ship Maiguez and for a brief period took the American crew hostage. Promoting detente and arms control with the Soviet Union. Promoting the Middle East peace process. An economic recession. An energy crisis. The New York financial crisis. All of these, are, by the way, are things that other Ford scholars and I talk about as well. But there are two other issues that I felt have not really been addressed by those who have worked on Ford as president and that Ford had to deal with too. Environmental matters, which very much were interested people at this time. 
and a growing desire among Americans to devote more attention to human rights in America's diplomacy. Ford addressed these issues from, from a couple of directions. First of all, believing that he had not been elected in his own right, he felt he couldn't ask for new programs. And second of all, he wanted to try to move the country down that moderate conservative direction he so believed in. For these two reasons, his belief in no new programs, his desire to move the country down a moderate conservative path, for these two reasons, he was more than prepared to use the veto. He used the veto 63 times, 23 times more than Richard Nixon did. In fact, Ford had more vetoes than agenda proposals. Yet Ford was prepared to compromise. Now, arguably, he was constrained. He had to contend with a Democratic-controlled Congress, one that had become even more strongly controlled by Democrats after the 1974 midterm election. But he was never one who was anathema to bipartisanship and compromise. For example, he signed a tax bill favored by Democrats that called for more cuts in taxes than Ford favored. But Ford signed the bill for a couple of reasons. It did cut taxes, and Ford believed if I don't sign the bill, then Democrats will propose a new bill that will ask for even greater government spending than I favor. He signed an energy bill that didn't do everything he wanted. But he signed it because it promoted energy conservation, it established a strategic petroleum reserve, and it allowed Ford to recommend decontrolling oil prices so as to promote conservation. Now, there was a price to be paid for all of this, for its belief in moderate conservatism and, at times, his willingness to compromise. His decision on energy, his decision on taxes, and other decisions he made, such as nominating Nelson Rockefeller as his vice president, someone from the liberal wing of the Republican Party, infuriated conservatives in the Republican Party. In fact, it was that conservative wing of the party that had been gaining strength since at least the 1960s. Ford's determination to continue detente and promote arms control with the Soviet Union displeased conservatives, and it also displeased neoconservatives among Democrats. Ford also hurt himself. He was accused of flip-flopping on issues, which he did at times. For instance, when he became president, he called for a, 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 tax, a, a surtax, a tax surcharge, as a way of dealing with America's economic troubles, then changes his mind and calls for a tax cut. And he never provided a vision for the nation as to where he wanted to take it. At one point, he talked about the new realism, but it was just the one time. Otherwise, Americans had no idea where these policy proposals fit into a bigger, a bigger vision of where he wanted the country to go. All Americans saw were policy proposals. And I would suggest to you, and I do suggest argue in the book, that Ford's failure to provide a vision was a reason why Ford lost the 1976 presidential election to Jimmy Carter. But there are other reasons that have been given as well. Of course, there was the Nixon pardon. Ford was challenged for the Republican nomination in 1976 uh, by Ronald Reagan, someone from the conservative wing of the party. It was a long, hard, dragged-out fight, one that battered Ford politically and made it hard for him, at least until after he secured the nomination, to focus on his Democratic rival. Ford made a famous gaffe during the second debate with Jimmy Carter when he said there was no Soviet domination of Eastern Europe. And then, being the stubborn person he could be, he refused to clarify matters for several days, which only compounded the error. There was an economic downturn before the election took place, and Ford seemed unable to figure out how to address it, at least how Americans saw it. And last but not least, there was a portrayal of Ford as a klutz. Some of you have probably seen the video clip. In 1975, Ford flew to Salzburg, Austria, to meet with the president of Egypt, Anwar Sadat. It was raining. The stairs of Air Force One were wet. 
Ford's walking down the stairs and all of a sudden slips down the stairs of Air Force One. And afterward, every trip, every slip, every fall or near fall on the ski slope became fodder for the media and for popular culture. Best example of this was how Ford was portrayed by Chevy Chase on Saturday Night Live. This really nice guy, but someone who couldn't walk straight and really wasn't very bright. What I argue is that all of these things, the pardon, the lack of a vision, the perception of Ford as a klutz, his inability to solve the, the economic recession that we were falling into, his failure to recognize just how strong of a candidate Reagan was, all of these things can fall under one larger umbrella, and that is image. Lyndon Johnson once said, Gerald Ford is so dumb, he can't walk and fart at the same time. Uh, the censored version said chew gum. It's actually something a little stronger, and so those of you who have read or heard things Lyndon Johnson said, I, I'm certain he used the other word. That's an interesting quote, because it suggests that Ford was an intellectually vacuous klutz. And I think what the nation came to see by 1976, during Ford's, certainly during Ford's tenure as president, was not an intellectually and vibrant individual who had played football, who had gone to Yale Law School, who swam, who skied, but rather they saw someone who was physically unsteady. And that physical unsteadiness became tied to an intellectual unsteadiness that led Ford to make bad decisions. Hence, the pardon, the inability to solve America's economic ills, the lack of a vision, the gaffe on Poland, all of these were part of this broader image of an affable but physically unstable and not too bright president. And I would argue more than anything else, that's why Ford lost. Following Jimmy Carter's inauguration, Ford leaves Washington, D.C., and he and Betty moved to California. They liked the weather there, thought it would be very good for Betty. They had friends there. Ford could play golf there. Yet Ford still was a lover of politics. He himself said, old habits die hard. He still remained very involved politically. He, would endor he endorsed Republican candidates, both for uh, national and state offices. He went stumping for them. Once again, he's gone a lot. And this was really hard on Betty. She thought, now that Ford's out of the presidency, we can finally spend time together, yet he's gone a lot again. She continues to abuse alcohol. She continues the addiction to the painkillers. Finally, Ford becomes aware of what's going on. And in 1978, there's an intervention, which Ford himself leaves, leads to make sure she got the care she needed. Yet, you couldn't take the work out of the workaholic, the politics out of the political animal. Ford still wanted to be in the game. In 1980, he thought about running for the presidency in his own right and, and said that he believed his wife would support him if he ran. When that fell through, he considered being Ronald Reagan's running mate, although that idea fell through as well because Ford wanted to have more power in a Reagan administration than Reagan wanted to give him. It is now that Ford begins to say, okay, maybe a political career isn't for me. But he still remained involved in politics. And he became more and more willing to criticize his party. He would stump for the candidates and he would support his party, but he would also criticize his party. He felt Ronald Reagan spent too much money on defense over too short a period of time. He felt Reagan was incurring too much of a debt. He opposed George W. Bush's decision to evade Iraq. He worried about his par party moving further and further to the political right. He disliked the growing partisanship he was seeing on Capitol Hill. And he became increasingly liberal on a number of social issues, including homosexual rights, abortion, and the Equal Rights Amendment for women. And I think it's safe to say that given where the Republican Party stands today, if Ford was still alive, 
he probably would be considered a rhino, a Republican in name only. Ford, who was always willing to reach across party lines and demonstrate bipartisanship, also began to develop in his post-presidential years a friendship with a former, another former president and Democrat, Jimmy Carter. The two of them criticized Israel, arguing that Israel stood in the, in the, stood in the way of the Middle East peace process. They joined forces in calling for the ratification of the North American Free Trade Agreement. They argued against impeaching Bill Clinton, favoring instead that he be censured. They urged President George W. Bush to continue the assault weapons ban that was, that was to expire in 2004, but failed to convince him to do so. At the same time Ford's involved in politics, he's making money. Now, in part, this was to for, fund the Ford Library and Museum. And indeed, he was able to raise enough money that both, op both facilities opened up in 1981. But he also had to make money for himself and his family. He made large amounts of money from speaking, speaking engagements, through his memoirs, and by sitting on numerous corporate boards, something that very much interested him. And he took some flack for this. His former press secretary, Gerald Tehorst, said that Ford was Ford Incorporated, a guy who was primarily interested in making money for himself, most interested in... Um, Financial, his financial well-being as opposed to thinking about others, if you will. And that stung Ford. He did not like that criticism. He said, for instance, I don't just sit in these corporate boards and do nothing. I'm working very hard for them. But he could also point out that he engaged in philanthropy. In 1977, he established the Jerry Ford Classic, a golf tournament that by the early 1990s had raised over a million dollars for charity. He helped save a theater in Palm Desert, California. He and his wife raised money to build it for an elementary school in Indian, well, Indian Wells, California. And Ford very much supported his wife's efforts to create what became the Betty Ford Center. Of course, all this couldn't continue forever. Age began to take its toll. And shortly after Christmas in 2006, Ford passed away. And it leaves a question. How should Ford be remembered? Gallup took a poll shortly after Ford left the presidency asking, what was Ford's greatest achievement? And of all the options given to people, the one that was chosen most often, no great achievement. Ford didn't do anything. And I think it says something about how Ford has been remembered by at least some people, and certainly I think we still see this in the textbooks today. Ford was essentially a caretaker president, a guy who kept the chair behind the desk in the Oval Office warm until either he was elected in his own right or someone else was elected in 1976. A caretaker president who has only major act was to pardon Richard Nixon. And of course, the part has been a lot in the news even recently, and so even today. I think that's what Ford is largely remembered for. But I would argue this assessment of a caretaker president whose only major act was pardoning Nixon is not fair. Ford had to deal with a myriad of issues as president, whether it be the Mayaguez crisis, or Vietnam, or the economy, or energy, or the environment. But there's something else about Ford, and this is what I think he should be remembered for, his belief in bipartisanship. I mean, an example right here. Today, this country is marked increasingly not just by partisanship, but an angry partisanship, one marked by accusations, harsh language, conspiracy theories, and disdain for the opposition. A partisanship where a willingness to reach across party lines is seen as tantamount to surrender to the opposition. That is not the type of country Ford would have wanted. And Ford's colleagues recognized this. In his eulogy for Ford, a fellow Michigander and a Democrat, Representative John Dingell, urged his colleagues in Congress to honor Ford by, and I quote, carrying out 
his legacy of bipartisanship in the years to come. It's an entreaty that's been forgotten in Washington. Thank you. And I'm happy to take some questions. I didn't do that well. <laughs> oh. we, we just slow, warm up slowly. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> I would appreciate it if you could expand a little bit on the lack of vision. And I was intrigued, as you quoted uh, in the conclusion, Ford admitted in his memoir what others had said about him, that he was not an intellectual or original thinker. Quote, the vision is to be defined as inspirational rhetoric and goes on again I didn't have it I, he had the ambition and it and he was certainly aware of the value I would submit of phrases like new frontier great society fair deal and all that I guess simply why did he not realize the need for that well two things number one is he said he never was really into those kinds of slogans that's part of it but I think also a lot of it is he was a congressperson at heart. And because he never became majority a House Speaker, I think oftentimes he thought in terms of policy proposals. What should our alternative proposals be for the policies coming out of the White House? As opposed to thinking about, okay, I'm now Speaker, or okay, I'm President, what should this broader vision be? And there's no better evidence, I think, of this idea that he was a congressperson at heart who thought in terms of, of strictly policy proposals than after, uh, after the Carter's inauguration, when Ford is in the helicopter leaving Washington, D.C., flies over the Capitol building, and he looks at the Capitol building and says, that's my real home. That's the way I think he thought. Thank you. Hi. A um, couple points I wanted to bring up. Um, first, what you were touching on as far as the, the Gallup poll about uh, choices. It, it struck me that, you know, during the time and since then, that um, maybe the major um, contribution that Gerald Ford gave to the country was um, to help us heal. We were in, you know, Vietnam was still going on, and and everything with Watergate. So that always struck me that Gerald Ford was the perfect uh, person to step in there and kind of, you know, bind the wounds that we're kind of suffering from. The, the, the other uh, thing that I want to bring up is um, he, he went into the president, he was catapulted into it and, and made perhaps um, one of the things is that, that you need an extended period of time that where you're considering um, going into the presidency in order to develop your agenda, in order to um, collect uh, a group of advisors and people who you think will help you help you know you formulate and coalesce those um, goals and how to get there. And it, it, I don't think he had time for that. He, he in, and perhaps also that. Uh, becoming president wasn't on his agenda for an extended number of years. Um, and also I wanted to ask, are you aware of whether he received any tutoring? I, I think presidents get to, I think President Obama probably had some advisors or people who helped tutor him to, you know, in terms of what to expect, what, what's going to happen and so forth. And I, I, I'm not sure about that, but are you aware of uh, presidents getting tutoring, you know, in the past. <laughs> I, I know that sounds, uh, you know, a little, little uh, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, naive, but, but I, I would think that, that there is a certain level of, you know, presidential tutoring that, that may go on. Right. Well, there are several issues here. Let me start with the healing. Uh, absolutely, that's the way he's being looked at today. Uh, when I spoke with these members of Congress, I talked to both Democrats and Republicans, and I asked all of them, what was, what was Ford's legacy be? And that was something that came up a lot, the idea of him as a healer. But at the time, uh, and there was hope that he would be that healer, but the pardon really hurt him for that, that period. 
And so this person who you see who, who's going to save us from the nightmare and be that healing agent all of a sudden now, was he part of a conspiracy? And, and the anger that that developed. And if you look at some of the letters people wrote forward, I mean, just furious with him. Um, so looking back at it, absolutely, at the time, a different story. Um, and just one other thing to add on to that, even people who criticized Ford for the pardon, such as Richard Reeves, have now looked back and said, you know what, it was the right decision. It was a brave decision. And, and it did, it was important to get that behind us and move on for the nation. Um, as for the vision thing and the tutoring, Americans, I would argue, want to have some idea where a president is going to take them. James Cannon did, has comment, commented in, in some of his uh, work, in one of his works, that yeah, you could s definitely, Ford did not come into the presidency with the idea of having a vision, and certainly he would need time to come up with something. But as time goes on, I think people want to know what are your plans for the country? Where do you want it to take us? And even members of Ford's own um, administration, like John Casterly, who's one of his sp speech writers, talked about this. We need a vision. We need to have some idea as to what, where we're taking this country. And he was getting frustrated that nothing was being provided in that respect. And as for the tutoring, Ford did have an, have an issue here because he had not sought to become president. But what also caused him problems in that respect is he brings in his own group of people, his own staff. But then there are these Nixon holdovers. And one of the things said about Ford was he was too nice, too willing to set his stamp on his administration and say, okay, we're going to clean house the Nixon holdovers. I'm going to bring in my people, and that way we can, we can go on this new path. Instead, there was this infighting within the administration over what direction the administration should go. It became national news. And it also caused problems for Ford, such as when writing his speeches and trying to figure out what he should say to the country. And so when it comes to tutoring, that proved an issue for Ford, because you do have this infighting over what he should be doing and, and, and causing problems. Uh, President uh, Ford selected Richard Cheney and I believe Rumsfeld yes. uh, as advisors, um, I think because of their knowledge of the intelligence community, um, <clears throat> and at least Cheney's views have proven to be quite dark. Um, why did he choose those two individuals? Is there any significance for that selection? Well, I mean, they had experience. They had uh, a lot of experience, uh, Rumsfeld with, with NATO. Uh, Cheney had done a lot of work in the Beltway as well and, and certainly proved to be very effective as a campaign manager. Uh, he was what, a second campaign manager. Um, so they both proved very useful. Uh, to, to add on, though, to your comment about Cheney, uh, definitely in his later years, Ford criticized both of them. Uh, especially Cheney, with regard to our actions against Iraq, thinking that Cheney had gone a little too overboard. You touched briefly on the fact that uh, Gerald Ford did not want to come back to, uh, or did not move back to Michigan. That seemed very unusual, being that he, he grew up here and all. Um, and I guess he rented a place in Colorado for a while or something. You probably know more than I do. But the reasons for not wanting to, even in the summertime, move back to Michigan, could you maybe explain? It seemed like an odd thing for him to do. Well, they were afraid they would be, have people pulling on them left and right if they came back here. Um, that was one thing. They wanted to have more, a little more privacy. But again, Ford likes to play golf. California offers nice weather year-round to play golf. They had friends out there like Bob Hope. And they, and they were both worried about Betty's health. And they thought that living in California would be good for them. So for those reasons, they decided not Michigan. They did, though, build a place in Beaver Creek, Colorado, uh, because Ford did enjoy skiing, and that way he could, he could do the skiing. But really what it came down to is they, just, they were afraid of having too, much, too many people pulling on them for their time. 
And it's kind of interesting if you think about it, given how Ford was more than willing to spend time doing stuff um, outside of the home, you know, going on, like, stumping for these candidates. But California was what they decided on. I was wondering if uh, Betty Ford was influential in uh, turning President Ford to a more liberal viewpoint. It's funny you bring that up. Uh, and I asked, um, some of, I asked a couple of my interviews, interviews that question. And then some of the people who were interviewed by Richard Norton Smith, uh, the, the oral history collection that is here at the, uh, through the Ford Library, uh, asked, about, asked that as well. And, and there is some belief that she did have an influence on him. Uh, because she was more liberal on those issues. But the argument could also be made that, in addition to her, her influence, since Ford was no longer in Washington, D.C., no longer involved in politics, it freed him up. And it allowed him to take positions that he might not have been able to while he was within the Beltway. But I, I think it's safe to argue that she, she probably did uh, have a significant influence on him, certainly in his post-presidential years. Thank you. And now for our speaker, we have a set of Gerald Ford signed pens for you to use, oh, signing copies you. of your book, and we hope you will use them in good health for your future publications Absolutely. as well. Thank this you. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. And I. As someone who knows uh, just a thing or two about President Ford and the papers and the records, not as much of our, as our archival staff, believe me, um, this was the most concise, I have to say, concise, quick summary that, uh, of, of President Ford's career that I think I've ever heard. Really quite remarkable how much you packed in in a, a short period of time. So I, I want to thank you for that because for me it brought things back to life. You really did, you really did hit a lot of, a lot of high points. Um, we have um, information out in the lobby about joining Friends of Ford if you're not already a member. And also, if you're not on our email lists, please do fill out one of the forms with your address because then you will get periodic messages, no charge, for, uh, for uh, attending the programs. And I want to say that with regard to Rumsfeld, um, one of our attendees tonight asked if we're going to do a live broadcast of that program over here, and we will look into that. That is a... We had, we had thought about it oh, when this first came up and then kind of ruled it out, but it might actually make sense. So we will see what we can do. Uh, and uh, so we, if, if so, if you're on our email list, you would get a notice of that, and we will do that. So that's on Thursday, uh, June 7th. But anyway, thank you so much. Yes? I know. I, I thought the backdrop here is the bricks. When you look at the bricks here... Uh, you're looking at that, and that's before we put lettering up. The, the screen is hiding some lettering that we, we added a, a, a few years ago. Yes, sir? Grand Rapids, 7 o'clock, and, and you need to reserve for it. Uh, the, the reservations are coming in fast. We're, we're preparing for overload there because we have a learning center where we're going to be remoting it as well. Um, but we will look into the possibility of broadcasting here. We've done a little. We're starting to play with that option, and that would be one where we can have a twofer, if you will, um, because it will be an interesting memoir from that period. He was known for literally coming out of Ford's office, and he would be seen, I've heard this story many times, and Tom Kuiper can maybe comment, taking notes. He had a little notebook in his pocket, and he was a, he's a copious note-taker, uh, the prior book that he did a few years ago uh, was copiously footnoted. Uh, he's very much a person with attention to detail. And so um, these are from his contemporaneous notes of his time in the Ford administration. So it should be quite an interesting portrait that none of us has probably seen based on his own experiences. So anyway, enjoy the reception. You may ask more questions and uh, have our speaker sign your book. And we thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.